This morning we'll be with uh, the section of scripture that's entitled in the story Riches in the Kingdom, coming from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We'll continue that and close that out and then move to the next section. But um, that's where we'll be this morning. Continue to remember those who are on our prayer list uh, in your prayers, uh, the Martin family especially. And in the bulletin there's an insert for volunteers in reference to his uh, celebration of life service on Saturday, things that they still need. Uh, and then uh, the times and all are in the bulletin as to that celebration of life. So remember uh, the Martin family in your prayers. Are there any other individuals that we need to remember in our prayers? Okay, then let's, uh, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father, we're so very thankful that you're our God. We're thankful for the privilege to be able to come to this place and, and study and listen and hear the words of Christ. We're thankful for the Gospels that tell us so many things that he said and did and those things that we need to hear as followers of him. Help us to be devoted and committed followers of your Son. And in doing that, followers of you. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for sending him into this world to take upon himself our sins so that we might live. We can never repay you, but we will praise you for all eternity. Thank you for loving us so much. We pray you'll be with us as a church, be with us individually, collectively. We pray for those who are on our prayer list, especially we lift up the Martin family to you. We ask that you be with them and comfort them as only you can. Be with us now as we study, open our hearts and open our minds that we might receive your word with joy and with gladness and then we might share it with others. Thank you for Christ. And it's in his beautiful name we pray. Amen. All right, if you remember last week, we dealt with uh, the riches, and Jesus made that famous statement, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And of course, the event that triggered that uh, now cliche uh, was the rich young ruler who came to him asking, what must I do? To have eternal life. Well, we didn't finish that section, but after the young man and the young ruler walks away, sad because Jesus told him to go and sell everything that he had and give it to the poor, he couldn't he couldn't make that that level of commitment. And so he went away sad, and of course Jesus, when he saw it, uh, was very sad and then turned to his disciples and said, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. So we'll pick up where the disciples were amazed at his words. So let's read from there to the close of the chapter. Sam, if you'll kick us off.
Okay. All right, so Jesus is continuing on this vein of how difficult it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Why? And we talked about this last week because we tend to trust in our riches. We tend to trust in our wealth and our taking care of ourselves. We, our goal in life, and we teach our children to be self-sufficient. Take care of yourself. Take care of your life. You know, pay your bills. Have a house. Have a car. You know, and, and all of those things in and of themselves are not wrong unless they're out of place. I heard one, one individual at Harding, I can't remember who it was, said it's okay to have possessions. Just don't let your possessions have you. And uh, that was a good, uh, I thought, a good analogy. But Jesus, basically after he says this, the disciples are amazed at his words. And Jesus answered them again. And I always find it interesting. And I didn't look it up. I, I think it would be interesting to look this up. How often Jesus referred to his disciples as children. And then I asked the question, why? But he says, children, how hard is it for those who trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? So he re reiterates it. Of course, this is Mark's account. But he calls them children. I, I actually sort of like that. Because what kind of father would Christ be? You know, and we are, in essence, when, when the Bible prophesied the coming of Christ, and it says his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us, and it says he shall be called Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father. He's talking about Christ. It's not talking about God the Father there, but he's the Father of the kingdom. We are his children and yet at the same time the bible says that we are his brothers and sisters we call each other brothers and sisters in christ so we're part of that kingdom but he tells his disciples who have been following him now for almost three years children how hard is it for those who trust in riches and i think one of the key words there is trust in riches let me tell you what, when it comes down to the end of our life, it doesn't matter how much money you got in the bank. The doctors can do everything that they can do, and you can be in the best hospital and the best care. No? You can't take the money. Can't take it with you. That's right. And no matter how much money you got in the bank, Howard Hughes, I think billionaire, is that right? He died in... A disgusting environment it doesn't matter how much money he had uh, in squalor locked in a room shut away from the world but he still died and it doesn't matter how much money Bill Gates has or any of the other people Musk and uh, what's that guy's name Zebo does Bezo yeah yeah Amazon dude I helped put him there you know but it doesn't matter when it comes down to the end of life and no matter how much money he has and no matter how many doctors he can hire and the hospital and the best care, it doesn't matter. All of this stuff, you leave it behind. You leave it behind. How difficult it is for those who trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, when his disciples heard it, this is, I always find the disciples, they have some interesting responses to Jesus. Uh, sometimes you can see them coming. Other times you can't. When the disciples heard it, they were exceedingly astonished, saying, And who can be saved? What's the young man asking that came to Jesus? What must I do to have everlasting life? I.e., to be saved. Yeah, yeah. Peter, Peter did. Actually, Peter also responded on the day of Pentecost to people who were asking, what shall we do? So, but they're asking then, who can be saved? It, it is. It is a logical question, but here's the thing. Are, are they rich, the disciples? No, they've, they've left everything. Peter's about to remind Jesus of that. Kevin. Right. And they're looking at it and they're saying, hey, I have all this riches, God's blessing me. Exactly. And I'm walking with money. Okay. Yeah. The mindset of that time was if you have riches and you've been blessed, then God's, God loves you and you're special. You know what? That's still out there. 
that's still out there. The health, wealth, and prosperity gospel says if you've been blessed and God's given you all this stuff, then you're highly favored. It's still out there. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I think really sometimes the poor are in far better shape than the rich because they realize their great need for something more than they can achieve from riches and through riches. But his disciples asked that question, then who can be saved? Now, I also tend to think that who's the, who's the guys listening at everything Jesus says, every word that falls from his lips, waiting for opportunity to nail his hide to the hen house door? The Pharisees. They're looking, well, those are the ones that are, are rich. I mean, Jesus at the beginning of his ministry drives out the money exchangers in the temple and then at the end of his ministry does it again. At the beginning of his ministry he says, you shall not make my father's house a house of merchandise. And by the end of his ministry, three to three and a half years later, he says, you have turned my father's house into a den of thieves. And of course, the whole point was they were making lots of money. They were getting kickbacks. They were wealthy from their position as leaders in the religious community. And keep in mind, also, this is a theocracy that's under the thumb of Rome, but still a theocracy. And the chief priest basically is the, is the president. Yes, ma'am. Uh, like a democracy except for a president, God is the king. God is the king. It's a monarchy, but it's also theo-God. It's actually put in place by God, which is exactly what happened uh, from the patriarchal age, the mosaic age, and even in the Christian age. God is still, the buck stops there. There's nowhere else for it to go. So it's a government, though, that is run. The, the nation of Israel was run uh, the law, the Pentateuch, was not just a, a law to tell them the great Ten Commandments as well as other uh, ceremonial and uh, ritual sacrifices, all the ins and outs of that, and uh, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. All of that was also their constitution. It was also their constitution and their, uh, their laws. And so it was run by God. Of course, Eventually, they wanted to be like other nations, and so they clamored for a king. And, of course, Samuel got very upset with the whole uh, thing, and, and uh, God basically said, they have not rejected you, they have rejected me. And, but he gave them a king. He, he put Saul in place in order to answer their, their request. And, of course, we know the story of Saul. Yes, ma'am. Samuel? Uh, he was the first prophet of... Well, it wasn't the first prophet. He was a prophet of uh, Saul. He actually ended up being Saul's prophet. And then, of course, uh, after him was Nathan, who ended up being David's prophet. But Samuel actually anointed David. He actually is the one that was sent to anoint David. While Saul was still king and David was just a boy, uh, so Samuel was a, a prophet. Uh, not a prophet like Elijah. Most prophets did not perform miracles and uh, such, but he was still God's spokesman. And, of course, he died during the, during the reign of uh, Saul. Saul actually went to the witch of Endor and actually called up his spirit from Sheol. Uh, and, of course, Samuel got a little upset with the whole situation. Yes? Uh, the witch of Endor. Uh, she, she lived in Endor, and she was a witch. So, <laughs> I have no idea who all the witch of Endor was, but she, she, she was not good, okay? So if you go to the palm readers and the soothsayers and stuff, stop it, all right? Just stop it. It's not right. It's not good. Actually, she, under the law, should have been stoned. I don't think she was, but still. Anyway, <laughs> who then can be saved? Looking at them, Jesus said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God, for all things are possible with God. You know, if you, I, I stop and take that question, then who can be saved? Well, with men, could we be saved in and of ourselves? No. There's no way that you and I would ever be saved. There's not enough good we could do in order to, in debt God to us to bring us back to God, to reconcile us to God, because the wages of sin is what? 
death. And who sinned? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So there's no way we could, even if we could pay for our sin, how? With our lives? Well, that's a consequence. The wages of sin is death. You sin, you die. And... Yeah, because of Adam and Eve's choice, right. And, of course, I've always maintained uh, that had you and I been in the garden and we had been Adam or Eve, we would have made the same choice. I believe those two individuals were perfect representations of man. Uh, and had we been there, it's likely that we would have made exactly the same choice. Maybe sooner, maybe later. I don't know how long it took before they made that decision. What gets me is they actually also had right, not just it's just the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but they also had right to the tree of life. And uh, that's interesting because when God drove them out of the garden, he put an angel with a flaming sword there and said, lest they enter in. Now that they've become sin sinful, there was something in that tree, lest they enter in and partake of the tree of life and live forever. Yeah. So... They were driven out because of their sin. The wages of sin, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And some people have taken issue with that and said, well, they didn't die that day. But the Hebrew actually points to in eating you shall die and in dying you shall die. It, it actually is something that's going to happen. That process of dying began the day that they rebelled against God and trusted a lie. They trusted a lie. And, and you know what? If you really want to bring a parallel along, riches can be a lie if you trust in them. And that's the difficulty here. That's right. We do the best we can. The best we can. Peter, I love Peter. He's so impetuous and so often just says what's on his mind. And he immediately... <laughs> I don't know if he's doing it because, well, we aren't rich, that's for sure. And he's actually the one later on that as they enter the gate beautiful and they see a man that's begging for, uh, for help, he says, silver and gold have I none. <laughs> so these guys weren't following Jesus because it was going to be an economic benefit or uh, you know, a, a landslide of uh, money coming their way down the road. But... Um, Peter says, look, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? You think that's a legitimate question? Yeah, I do. We're, we're two and a half, maybe almost three years into the ministry of Christ. You know, we're only, uh, well, we're only 51 pages away from the end of this, this story. Uh, we're not far from the crucifixion either. A few months. So, They've been, now if you remember, when we first started this, how many times did Jesus have to call Peter and Andrew and James and John? He had to call them three times. Three times. They kept going back to fishing. So if you go back and you read, you'll see where they were called about three times. It says two, but I think there was another one in there that uh, was hard to weave in. But anyway... Uh, they kept going, of course, they've got to work. They've got bills to pay. They've got groceries to buy. They've got clothes that the family needs. And we know Peter was married because Jesus, from the very beginning of his ministry, healed his mother-in-law. So we know he was married. So they had responsibilities. But Peter, at this point, is pointing out something that's very important. We've left everything to follow you. And I'm not sure how they did it, to be honest with you. I'm not sure how they... They left family and wives and went off and followed Jesus for this time. And how was, how was the needs of life for their family? Or maybe their family came too. I'm not altogether sure. I know that there are times when over 100 are with Jesus following him. There's the one instance where he sends out the 70 to spread the message about his uh, coming to visit the towns nearby and the villages. But he says, uh, we've left everything and followed you, what will we have? What's on the other side of our dedication and our commitment? What, what's on the other side? 
Life eternal. Everlasting life. What a deal. I mean, I wouldn't want to have everlasting life in a mortal body, that's for sure. Uh, how many operations would you have to have as you grow down through the things and, and things that have to get fixed? But, boy, an immortal body? And that's what the scriptures promise. Paul, actually, in 1 Corinthians 15, will say, When Christ comes again, the dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him. The mortal must be put on immortality, and that which is corruptible must be put on incorruption. So he talks about that resurrection of the dead and how we will, in fact, fare on that day as followers of Christ. So it's a legitimate question. What will we have? Mia. I'm sorry? Why do we still have to die? Well... Because of the wages of sin. Right. It's death. Uh, actually, th that is it. Uh, once mankind became rebellious, in essence. I mean, uh, disobedience is rebellion. I mean, we, we don't equate it with that, but it is. It's saying to God, I'm, I don't want to do what you want me to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. Uh, yeah, Eve partook of the... Tree And like I said before in a sermon not too long ago, the devil was able to follow her with a question and two sentences. I mean, it's just amazing that he was able to get her to, let, to not trust God because that's what it boils down to. And God actually took the same thing. Now, the consequences of that rebellion have lasted and will last to the coming of Christ. Uh, the wages of sin is death. The, we're still guilty of sin. Even though our sins have been washed away and our sins have been uh, dealt with at the cross by virtue of Christ and by virtue of our obedience to him, we still are guilty of sin in our past. Therefore, the wages of sin is death. Everyone must die. Actually, it's in my sermon this morning, Hebrews 9 and verse 27, uh, for uh, all must die. And after this, the judgment for everyone dies. Now, there's exceptions to that rule. How many exceptions to that rule? Two. Enoch and Elijah. Those two did not die. But out of 108 billion people that have passed through this world, there's only those two exceptions to that rule. So the wages of sin is death. We have to die because we are guilty of sin, but yet our sins have been dealt with at the cross, and we will be completely and absolutely justified in the resurrection of the dead and given everlasting life because of what Christ accomplished at the cross and because we're in Christ because we're hid in Christ we wear his righteousness but it is imputed righteousness it is imputed and imparted to us by virtue of the life that Christ lived sometimes we think well you know I, I'm saved because of the death of Christ you are but you're also saved because of the life of Christ it is by his life that God imputes to us his righteousness. So when God looks at you and God looks at me, he sees the righteousness of Christ because we are in Christ. Our lives are hid with God in Christ. Yes, ma'am. Yes, everything, it all boils down to heart. It always has. That's why I believe that Jesus picked those 12 disciples because they had hearts. Were they good men? I, I believe so, but they also were men. And uh, Peter himself, when he realized something special about Christ, fell down at his knees and said, Lord, depart from me. Why? For I am a sinful man. So he recognized his sinfulness, and I believe that's part of the reason he was chosen because his heart was willing to be broken. Yes, ma'am. Well, 
Well, actually, Jesus will make that statement on a number of occasions. He'll talk about the first being last and the last being first. Keep in mind, I believe that always, because <laughs> I think Jesus was almost constantly told by these Pharisees who considered themselves first from God's point of view. Actually, I'm still in all my thunder. Every Sunday, I always still my own thunder. But uh, this morning, I'll actually mention the publican and the Pharisee who went up to the temple to pray. And what did the Pharisee do? Lord, I thank you that I'm not like this guy. Actually, you're pretty lucky to have me on your team. You know, I go to church every Sunday. I give tenth of everything I, I own. And he just planted all his flowers. Yeah, he didn't get that. He didn't get that it didn't mean anything. But the fact is, uh, uh, I think Jesus makes those statements because, one, he may have been eavesdroppers may have been listening in that thought they were prerogative, had prerogative because of their religious place, but also to keep his disciples from becoming like that. The temptation's there. The temptation's there to become proud, uh, especially if you're a leader. I mean, Paul actually received more revelation than any of the other disciples. Uh, when he was converted, he went down to Arabia for three years. He actually will state, and we're studying in Corinthians on Wednesday night, as well as in Galatians, he'll actually state that I did not receive these things from men, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. But he has, at the same time, at the same time, God actually gave him intentionally a thorn in the flesh. Now, there's been a gallons and gallons and pools and pools full of ink spilled on what was Paul's thorn in the flesh. But the reason the thorn in the flesh was given to him was why? Lest he become puffed up because of the abundance of revelations. So God actually said, all right, I'm going to keep you humble by giving you this thorn in the flesh. Now, I'll be honest. My opinion is that he had... What, what, what was it with Saul of Tarsus? What was his biggest problem? He couldn't see. He couldn't see that Jesus was the Messiah. So he's persecuting the church and everything else. So what does God do to him on the road to Damascus? What happens? He smites him with blindness. Then he's told to go into the city and it shall be told you what you must do. He goes into the city for three days. He prays and fasts. He knows I have been wrong. I've been persecuting Jesus of Nazareth who I thought was a false Messiah. His people who I thought were false promoters of this false Messiah. And now... I realized I was wrong. So for three days, he prayed and fasted. He didn't eat. He didn't drink. And Ananias was sent to him by the Holy Spirit. Go and tell him all the words of this life. He's a chosen vessel unto me. Remember, Jesus told him on the road to Damascus, Go unto Damascus and shall be told you what you must do. So I ask a question. Did he believe? Did he believe on the road to Damascus? Did he believe in Jesus after Jesus uh, uh, confronted him? I think so. I don't see how he couldn't believe in Jesus. Did he repent? Three days. He didn't eat. He didn't drink. All he did was pray. Don't tell me in those three days he did not say, Lord, forgive me. But that wasn't enough. He did, it. He did exactly. Yeah, he persecuted the church. He persecuted Christ. So I have no doubt he believed in Jesus. I have no doubt he repented. He actually, when he said, Lord, what would you have me to do? He used the Greek word kurios, which means Lord, Master. It can also be used as sir, all right? But in that case, when the Messiah is confronting you from heaven and blinding you by the light, it seems like to me the Lord there would have been Lord, you know? So in my opinion, that's almost a confession of his lordship. Uh, so here he is. He's believed. He's repented. He's called Christ Lord. And he's still told by a man sent from God to arise and be baptized and wash away his sins. He was still in his sins. Now, I'll just give away my whole sermon. Y'all can go home. You don't have to stay for the sermon today. But anyway, no, I'm just kidding. You can't go home, all right? You can't do that. All right. No, you're not going home. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, if we come to Christ. Exactly. Uh, Hebrew, uh, Matthew, the 10th chapter, verse 28. Fear them not which destroy the body and are not able to destroy the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in Gehenna. 
So yes, we are mortal beings in hope of everlasting life. That's the whole promise of John 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why? That whosoever believes in him should not perish. And that word means to be destroyed, but have everlasting life. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Yes. And I've, listen guys, uh, I haven't basically dealt with this yet, but I've been studying it in depth. And I believe that uh, when it comes to, and I know this is away from the, from the thing here, but I have been studying in depth for the last year and a half, two years, a thing called conditional immortality. And that is where those who come to Christ will have everlasting life, but those who do not they will be destroyed. So my whole concept of everlasting conscious torment is being altered by Scripture itself. Whosoever believes in him should not what? Perish. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Fear them not who destroy the body and are not able to destroy the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul. In hell. Will people go to hell? Yes. But does justice dictate everlasting conscious torment for the 16 year old who made mistakes for three or four years as he's accountable to God? Should he be tormented for all eternity, billions and billions and billions? Is that justice? So I'm not going to get on that too much. I'm still studying it. There's a couple of verses I'm still working with in regard to that that you have to work with. But when it says the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not, that's a direct quote from Isaiah the 66th chapter when the new heaven and the new earth comes in. And they go out to see the corpses of those who rebelled against God where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. But those are dead people. Do what now? I'm sorry. The second death. Yeah, there's a ton of stuff to this. Actually, I'm working on an entire presentation that I plan on presenting to the elders first to see if they see it like I'm seeing it before I bring it out to the church. But it's it's a huge upheaval in my theology that I have embraced for so long. And I will remind you the traditional everlasting conscious torment view started with Constantine and the Catholic Church. So, I'm just going to leave that there. I I probably shouldn't have opened that can of worms. Worms all over the place, you know. I don't want to do that this morning. Not ready for that, all right? (laughs) Yeah, I know, I know. I'm going to come back to it, but after I've had time to share and talk with the elders about it and uh, show them and share with them the things that I've I've discovered recently. So, let's get off that one because I'm not ready to go there yet. Kay, you had a question. You forgot? <laughs> Sorry, I, I got on a little bit of a roll there. All right, so anyway, uh, the things which are possible with men are impossible with men are possible with God. All things are possible with God. Now, watch Jesus' reply to Peter's, we've left everything to follow you. What shall we have? He says, most assuredly, I tell you, you who have followed me, that in the regeneration When the Son of Man will sit on the throne of His glory, you also will sit on twelve thrones judging the tribes, twelve tribes of Israel. Now this is important because one, Jesus uses a phraseology here that He uses in other places. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory. It's also in Matthew 25. Then He shall sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He'll set the sheep on His right hand and the goats on His left. He'll say to those on His right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was sick and you came to me. I was in prison and you visited me. And they shall say, When did we see these things in accommodate you and he'll say and as much as you've done it unto the least of these my disciples you have done it unto me so that phraseology is there in that great judgment scene and here he actually gives it another name he says you who have followed me you in the regeneration when the son of man will sit on the throne of his glory So the second coming of Christ is also considered and called by Jesus himself as the regeneration 
the renewal of all things. It's interesting how the uh, parousia, the unveiling, the revealing of Christ, it's interesting how that actually is all encapsulated and so many people have broken it up into a thousand years or seven years tribulation and all that stuff. It's going to happen in a single day. There's nothing left that needs to be done for Christ to come. There is no second earthly temple that has to be built where the Dome of Rock now sits. There is no Antichrist that will come and sit in the midst of that temple that's been rebuilt and actually have men worship him as he is God. All of that is symbolic and has to do with other things that uh, actually I'm putting together a whole other class after we finish uh, Corinthians or actually probably somewhere, maybe I'll work it in in 1 Corinthians 15, but uh, that whole second coming and all the different views regarding that. There's premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial, praetorist, and partial praetorist. There's like five different views regarding the second coming of Christ. I think I've been just about all of them in my life because you got to be willing to study things. And even if it upsets the apple cart, even if it flies in the face of something your church believes, uh, it doesn't matter. What does the scriptures teach? What do the scriptures teach? That's what matters. And I'm talking about the totality of scripture, not a verse here or a verse there. I'm talking about all of them. But Jesus actually gives his second coming another, uh, another title, if you will, uh, that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on the throne of his glory, you will also sit on 12 thrones judging the tribes of Israel. Now, do you think that disciples got what he was talking about no I think they're still thinking earthly king gonna release us from the domination of Rome the reason is because James and John on the very night Jesus is going to be betrayed they come to him and say grant that we may sit one at your right hand and one at your left when you come into your kingdom what did they say after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, when they're on their way to the Mount of Olives and Jesus is about to be ascended into heaven? What did they ask him on the way to that unbelievable event they were about to witness? All right, will you at this time restore the kingdom? They're still looking for a physical kingdom. They think that he's going to sit on the throne of David with a rod of iron and rule the nations because those prophecies are there. They failed to understand that the kingdom that Christ would bring in would be spiritual and it would reign in the hearts of men, not in a territory in the Middle East. So these, uh, these statements, I'm sure, may have caused them, you shall sit on 12 tribes, or 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes, these things may have actually caused them to think, okay, physical kingdom. Physical kingdom makes sense to me. Uh, Jesus goes on to answer Peter's question. There is no one who has left houses or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children or lands for the kingdom of God's sake, that's Luke, and for my sake, that's Matthew, and for the gospel's sake, that's Mark, who will not receive many times more, 100 times more, in this time and in the world to come, what? Eternal life. Eternal life is the gift, and we need to get that. But it's eternal life from the one who alone possesses immortality. But many who are last will be first, and the first will be last. Be careful, guys. Don't get puffed up and think you're first. Be last. Be the servant of all. You know, when Jesus on the night that he was betrayed and the disciples were all gathering around, by virtue of tradition, the youngest should have basically washed everyone's feet at that feast. Who was the youngest? John. It's interesting that John records the event because I imagine he was like a lot of us that, man, I really blew it there. But he at least was humble enough to record the event and say, yes, I, I should have been the one that washing feet. But by recording the event, Jesus actually serves those who should have been serving him. So, we're servants. We're called to serve. Not to be first, 
but to be last. And that's just the way it should be. All right, I'm out of time, and they're motioning for me to hush down and shut down and all that, so we're going to do that. Uh, thanks for being here. Hope I didn't uh, upset your apple cart too much. Uh, I am still studying the conditional immortality uh, idea. There's basically three views on hell, universal Universalism that says everybody eventually is going to be saved. Conditional immortality that only those who come to Christ will receive everlasting life. The others will be destroyed. And then the traditional view, everlasting conscious torment. And uh, so those three views are the ones that are out there. And maybe uh, with the elders' approval, I will be able to present that class at one point down the road in the future. But it is complicated. And it is very, very involved. And... I don't believe it has anything to do with your salvation. We'll find out when we get there, all right? That's for sure. But it does portray a picture of God and justice, and we need to understand it. So I'll leave that right there, and uh, we'll come back to it when the time is right. Let's have a closing prayer. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being our God. Let these words sink deep into our heart, knowing that the riches and the cares of this world bring us very little uh, we can enjoy some of them, but help us to use them in your service, your kingdom, to help others to spread the gospel. We thank you for loving us. Be with us now as we break to worship in spirit and in truth. Clear our hearts and our minds that we might do so, that our worship might be acceptable. Thank you for Jesus who makes us acceptable to you. For we pray it in his precious name. Amen. Thanks for being here. <laughs>